Welcome to I Rise Conversations with Joan. Welcome to I Rise Conversations with Joan. My name is Joan Wosu and I'm the award-winning author of the book, I Rise, The 10 Secrets to Getting Up When Life Knocks You Down. Every parent hopes for a healthy baby and young kids. But the truth is that every day, many children are being diagnosed with medical conditions that alter their lives and the lives of their families forever. Research has shown that the rate of people being diagnosed with type 1 diabetes has been rising across the globe, and in particular amongst younger children. Raising a child is one of the most rewarding things in the world, yet one of the most difficult as well. At type 1 diabetes and everything changes. The emotions can range from anger to fear to joy and many others in between. But having the right information and support can lighten the load as you learn to navigate this new life for you and for your child. Our guest today is Helen Wills. She started her blog, Actual Mommy, in 2011 when she realized that talking to the four walls and a baby was never going to be enough. In 2014, her eldest daughter was diagnosed with a life-altering, life-threatening medical condition at the age of nine. Through a process of transformation involving therapy, acceptance, and experimentation, she became a much calmer parent, allowing her to cope better than she imagined when the teenage years hit. Helen now produces her own podcast called Teenage Kicks to help other parents support their teenagers' mental health. And she's also an award-winning blogger. Welcome, Helen, to the show. Oh, thank you so much for having me. It's lovely to have such a lovely introduction. (laughs) Thank you. So, Helen, tell us a little bit about how your life and your family was before your daughter was diagnosed. Yeah, I mean, typical 2.4 children, nuclear family set up. I had a girl and a boy. We live in um, on the outskirts of London in a very nice city. Mm. Um, we didn't really have any problems. Uh, my kids are interesting characters, as everyone's children <laughs> are. Maddie is my eldest, um, and she's really quite feisty she has been since birth she's always been entertaining and sometimes hard work um (laughs) and then her brother is um two years younger and he's just a completely different kettle of fish he's much more pragmatic he's more introverted quieter um easier as a baby in some ways um but no 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 children are ever easy they all have their their moments um but yeah we were just living living the normal life Mm -hmm. wow and then the diagnosis happened so how did you figure out that something wasn't quite right what happened um so I noticed that I think the first thing I really noticed was that we couldn't go more than an hour in the car on a journey without needing to stop for the toilet, which is which was different to usual. Maddie was nine, almost 10 by this point. So we didn't need to stop for toilet trips. But suddenly um, a visit to my mum, who lives two hours away, would need at least two toilet stops along the way. Um, and... I knew something about the symptoms of type 1 diabetes because a friend of mine has a daughter who had been diagnosed a couple of years earlier. Um, So that was when the alarm bells began to ring, but I looked back at her symptoms previously and she'd had a couple of really nasty illnesses that we hadn't known how to deal with. Um, She had urticaria in the summer so she was absolutely covered in red blotches and we thought excuse me we thought it was an allergic reaction um and I took her to the GP and the GP prescribed steroids so it was was quite it felt like quite a big deal it wasn't just a run-of-the-mill viral cold flu type thing yeah um and also in the summer beforehand I realized she'd had a lot of mouth ulcers So constantly for about a month, she kept getting mouth ulcers and had three or four of them at a time. And that was new. Mm. Uh, And looking back, that was probably all high blood sugar. And it may have been the virus and the urticaria that that 
that triggered the, the diabetes, but the ulcers aren't uncommon when you've got undetected high blood sugars. Um, she was getting up in the night to go to the toilet, which was not really like her. Um, and uh, yeah, she, one night she wet the bed and, I, and that, she'd not done that for so many years. And that's when I suddenly knew this is probably bad. I still tried to fight that knowledge in my head. I thought maybe it's just a bladder infection and stress. She was nine. She was maybe starting to think about the next school. So I was like, oh, it's just stress. It's a bladder infection. It'll be fine. But yeah, I, I deep down, I knew. And and that's very common with a lot of parents because you, you do want your child to be okay. So you go through a couple of phases. So you already talked about the whole in denial. Well, it's like, no, I'm hoping it's not. I hope she's okay. I hope it's something else. But deep mm -hmm. down, you know, what are some of the other emotions or phases that parents go through when they, they know that something might not be quite right? Oh, huge anxiety. The night she wet the bed, I just got onto Google and start, and my stomach was sinking. I, I just thought what, I, I mean, the denial kicked in. I just thought there's no point until I get to a doctor, there's no point panicking about this. It's probably nothing because I've been a bit of a panicker. I'm quite well known in our family as the warrior. I catastrophize <laughs> a little bit. Um, or I did, I used to, um, and so I was really giving myself a grown up talking to like, probably not. The doctor's just going to laugh and say you're overreacting. Let's be fine. But yeah, loads of anxiety. Um, and then guilt when I realized that it was it was what it was and it was as serious as, as it could be. Um, how would I not picked it up sooner? I think that's really common with parents because we were lucky. We picked Maddie up really early. She wasn't ill. Um, lots of children are in real trouble by the time it's type one diabetes is detected and, and children have died because of a late detection of, of diabetes. Um, so the guilt is, is huge when you see your child in a hospital bed unconscious perhaps because that's what happens in the end um so it's a really guilt is really common and then did I cause this and and, and I know that I didn't but you, you know there is no cause that we know of for type 1 diabetes nothing that parents have done correlates in any study to a type 1 diabetes being triggered it's genetic, it's in their system somewhere. Um, they could live for years without it. And then suddenly something triggers the switch. And I think it probably was that virus. Mm. But even then I was like, what if I hadn't overreacted to the rash and taken her to the doctor and the doctor hadn't prescribed steroids? Would it have been because steroids can trigger it? Um, could I have breastfed for longer? What if I cut dairy out of my diet? All of these things, and it's so typical and common of parents to blame themselves because they just don't want any of this for their children. Mm, yeah. So how were you able, because that, that once you're in that kind of mindset and mode, then you're anxious all the time, you're, you're low, your energy is low, and this is when the child needs you to be strong for them. Yeah. So how were you able to transition to a much accepting, calmer parent to really support your child? Yeah, well, I won't lie. It took several years. Um, type 1 diabetes is life threatening and it's very scary. It can kill you in your sleep. In fact, that's the most likely time for type 1 diabetes to kill someone is when they're asleep. Um, so I went into overdrive with anxiety and catastrophizing. Um, I remember on the very first night in hospital, just asking anyone who would stop and talk to me to reassure me that she wasn't going to die at university um, because I had a friend who had died in her sleep at university. Uh, and so that's all I could think of in eight years time, nine years time when she won, will she be able to have the life that we assumed she would have? Cause it's the life that we had. Um, so I, I couldn't think of anything except her mortality. It was really, really scary. And there's also a lot to learn with managing diabetes. It's the, There's a really funny photograph meme of um, 
somebody pouring through a textbook and it's about one and a half foot high and it's open and they're looking through this enormous book and it says everything you need to know about type one diabetes volume one (laughs) (laughs) and that's exactly how it is there is so much to know and even when you know absolutely everything you still can't stay on top of it all you can do is deal with whatever numbers come your way because diabetes does its own thing you can't you can plan but diabetes will often not do what you expect it to do so I spent the first two years really as you say being strong for my daughter because she was devastated and learning everything that I could learn to teach her as much as anything what she would need to be doing and I'm whilst I'm glad I did that it did absolutely destroy me um I I have a condition called fibromyalgia which is um chronic pain and stress contributes to that and so although I'd been in quite a good place with it I woke up one morning after about two years of looking after this crazy toddler that I describe as diabetes because it is um and I had such pain down my arm that I I went to see chiropractors acupuncturists massage therapists eventually the doctor I had steroid injections and nothing worked and after about six months of trying to deal with this increased pain, I had pain all over my body at this point because I just hadn't been looking after myself at all. Um, I decide, I read a book called The Body Keeps the Score. If you know that one, it's by a guy called Bessel, Bessel van der Kolk. Okay. And it's amazing for anyone with con- chronic pain. And I suddenly realized, oh, This pain that is that has taken up residence in my joints and my muscles is the emotional pain that I haven't been processing. And that's when I began my therapy journey. And that's how I've transitioned to being much calmer. Wow, that's interesting. So an emotional pain was causing a physical pain. It was manifesting physically in your body. And I think a lot of people don't realize that stress because stress is one of the biggest killers. So people just say, oh, I'm stressed, I'm stressed. Mm-hmm. But stress, if not dealt with, can mm-hmm. show up in, in other ways, in real pain, real physical pain and other diseases. Okay. So you started your therapy, you got the help that you needed to be able to support your daughter. And now things are going better. So you had mentioned that you were trying to teach your daughter some of the changes that she would need to make. What are some of the biggest challenges and changes that you as a family had to incorporate into this new life? Well, I mean, it affects everything. The obvious thing is is food. So carbohydrate all turns into sugar in the bloodstream. Um, and that's not, I sort of knew that from biology classes, but I... It's not something I'd ever really thought about. Even the the things that you're supposedly going to be healthier if you eat, like oats and brown rice and quinoa, even things like that, if they're carbohydrates, they are going to raise your blood sugar. And if you don't have a functioning pancreas, then you've got to manage the input of insulin to meet the timings of those foods. So the first thing we learned to do was weigh every single piece of carbohydrate that she ever ate. Um, We don't anymore because it's been eight years and we sort of know we can eyeball a plate and, and know more or less how many carbs are on it. Um, But for a long, long time, we had to weigh everything and she had to Take, you have to take insulin 20 minutes before you start eating. So with a child, that's really hard. I had to call her down before every meal, plan how much carb she was going to eat, make sure she had the injection, send her away. If she was hungry, tough, she had to wait. If she was very high and we had to put a correction dose of insulin in, then she had to wait even longer for it to come down before she could eat. So sometimes I'd have the whole family waiting for dinner and her brother was six at this time. And I'd say, well, either we can eat without Maddie, which is feels really unfair to me, or we all just have to wait until it 
and it takes as long as it takes until her blood sugar comes down to a normal level when she can start eating. Um, so that was the biggest thing. And then exercise reduces blood sugar when there's insulin in your system. So every time she ate, we had to be aware of whether or not she was likely to be running around with her friends or ice skating, which is her sport. Yeah. Um within two hours of eating because that's what that's how long the insulin takes to finish working two or three hours so there was a real lack of spontaneity um and 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 we worked really hard to build that back in I always said I'm not going to let this change your life Maddie in terms of the things you can and can't do it's going to change your life dramatically I'm not going to let it stop you so I think three days after we came out of hospital, she'd been booked to try a surf simulator at a theme park. And she was so looking forward to doing it. But that's extreme physical exercise. Um, And so I said, right, well, we're going. And I was there with a great big hold all of supplies. I had sugary drinks and sweets and biscuits and the test kit, needles. I took a sharps bin with me for the needles because that's what we'd been taught. And we don't do that anymore. We just manage them and deal with them when we get home. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's how we've lived life, basically. And she's had some scary situations, but we go prepared we basically we all take big bags out with us now whenever we go anywhere so we've always got sugar if she needs it and we've always got spare supplies Mm -hmm. for her injections wow so it it sounds like she's living quite a normal life because I think for a lot of parents like you alluded to first you're scared about her mortality but then again the changes how she's going to feel like I'm different I can't do the things that my pairs do but it sounds like she's still able to live a, a, quite a normal life as compared to, to other now she's a teenager to other teenagers and I think that's something that a lot of parents need to hear more of I, do, I don't know how much information there is out there how much support there is out there but I know that some of my friends who have had children who are diagnosed with medical conditions they always feel alone they always yeah. feel like I'm the only one no one knows what I'm going through and I'm just here trying to deal with all of this on my own my child's never going to have a normal life but you're here sharing that you're still able to do everything. You just, first of all, you went and got the knowledge. So you spent two years learning about everything that needs to change. And the entire family was on board, really working together to make sure that she felt she could live a normal life and she felt very supported. Yeah, no, that's exactly it. And actually you hit the nail on the head with feeling lonely. It does feel incredibly lonely when your child is the only one you know who has a, a medical condition. And I mean, she can do everything she wants to, but there's an awful lot more danger to it and there's more planning to it and there's less spontaneity. So as a teenager, you know, if they all decide they're going to go and buy pizza on the way home, that's tough for her. And she does it, but she has to make a choice between do I want the pizza enough um, to take the injection? Do I want it enough to, because I know that it's going to raise my blood sugars too quickly before I can get, get it to come down with insulin? Um, do I want to go with them and buy my pizza, but wait 20 minutes before I eat it when they've all finished, Mm. you know, she's always balancing decisions about her health when she's trying to teenager is probably one of the hardest ages with, with diabetes because they are spontaneous and they're doing hedonistic things. Um, so she's always weighing up. Shall I, shall I do this and pay the price and feel a bit ill later on or and and you know worry about my long-term health a little bit more because that's the risk Mm -hmm. um or shall I not do this and feel slightly like I'm different to everybody else so it's not fun the thing I'd say about feeling lonely is thank god for the internet because there are a lot of support groups for people going through the same as you we still have only met one person in nine years that we can really relate to in real life who has this condition and nobody that we know and knew before has had this diagnosis since. So it is still very isolating, but I'm in so many Facebook groups. I need to leave some of them now, actually, but (laughs) 
I, I will always stay in one or two of these Facebook groups because there's always someone there at three o'clock in the morning when you're you've just had a really scary blood sugar to deal with and you're scared and you're panicking or you're worried about the next big thing that your child's going to do with this condition. Like I was always worried about school trips um, and now I'm worried about university. There's always someone there who's done it before you and I can't tell you it's going to be all right, but can tell you that they've been all right and how they did it. And if they can't help you, they can say, I totally get how you're feeling. And that is priceless. To have someone know the shoes that you're in is priceless. And I, yeah, in my real life, I, I don't know anyone like that. Yeah. it's very lonely so thank goodness for facebook groups and yeah, so, instagram and twitter yeah and so i think i think that's a good idea for people who might be feeling lonely who might not know anyone in their immediate circles who are going through the same thing to go online and find join some support groups some of them might be overwhelming like you said but i think that's a good place to get started just so that you're not alone you're actually speaking mm -hmm. to people who have been through or who are going through what you're going through because they truly understand because i know what it feels like when someone says oh i know what you're going no you don't know what you haven't you, you can't know how, how do you you just don't know so no I we had a really funny one actually um not funny at the time but i can laugh now because it's very common lots of parents of, of, of diabetic children have had this when we told someone and um this this lady said oh gosh yeah oh that's so tough my dog has diabetes so i totally get it <laughs> Oh, no. We were like, um, <laughs> not the same. <laughs> really not scary. I, I, you know, you love your dog. It's scary. It can do the same to him, but no, no, not the same. Not the same. <laughs> okay. So now you do you advocate for that type one diabetes. How has that been? Is there more support available? Do you work with parents who their children are going through exactly the same thing? What do you do to help other parents? Yeah. So, I mean, there are some of the charities are really support supportive and um, JDRF is in the UK as well as the as um, America. Well, JDRF is all over the world. They're a, t a specialist type one diabetes charity and they're brilliant at advocacy and showing stories of people living. And I think in the US, there's um, Beyond Type One is a great organization. It's really is that kind of letting people know that you can live beyond type one you don't have to let it control you um as far as what I do is concerned I um just anecdotally was recommended by people like talk to Helen it happens a lot if some if friends of mine know someone whose child gets diagnosed they'll put me in touch and often they'll come and talk to me and so I just started offering it as a, a a kind of a peer support service as part of what I do. Um, and if anybody wanted to take advantage of that, and I, I don't take a professional fee for that at the moment, I just take a donation if somebody wants to donate and I donate it to the charities for research um, because I, I just know how much I desperately wanted to meet somebody who was dealing with the same as me. So I I do peer support for people and and help them understand Really, it's two pronged what I do with people. One is to let them know that their child is more than likely going to be OK. They are going to be able to do all the things. Yes, it's going to be very hard and it's a huge life change, but they can still do it. Mm -hmm. And then the other side of what I do is to acknowledge for them that this is full on grief because when your child's diagnosed with something like this, especially if it's something that society doesn't really get and thinks is trivial and not a big deal, which is how it is with diabetes, it can be really easy to think you have to shut up and go away and get on with it and you're overreacting. And that is not the case at all. No one's overreacting with a, a diagnosis like this. And they are experienced experiencing grief um, and the reason I know that is I, I'm now training to be a counsellor as a result of the you know having helped people it's felt good and people have said it's felt useful for them so I'm training to be a counsellor and my first year essay was on um, disenfranchised grief so grief that you don't feel able to express that you get no validation for you know if somebody dies 
everyone will rush to your side and tell you how sad that is and how they feel for you and they'll validate that feeling but with something like this people don't know how to react or they trivialize it and then you've you've got nowhere for your grief to go so I like to get people to recognize that they are allowed to grieve this and I went through in researching my essay I realized that I went through all the typical stages of grief so you mentioned denial and then anger, and then bargaining, you know, what if somebody else got this? What if I could have it instead of her? Um, how could it have been different? And and then depression, uh, and then eventually acceptance. And I, I, you know, I still get angry, so I still counsel people now. So it's okay still to be angry nine years later. Of course it is. This is frustrating. Um, but yeah, I think a lot of people don't feel able to acknowledge that they're grieving. That is true. Wow. That's all. Well, kudos on studying to become a counselor. I, th I think you've already done an amazing work and being able to help so many and support other parents as well. I think that will really make a difference in a lot of people's lives. So let's talk teenagers now. Oh my God. So yeah. So <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't the easiest one of them. No. Yeah. I was, <laughs> I was a terrible teenager. I, I don't know what was wrong with me. I just didn't want to listen to anyone. So yeah, so my parents were scared, <laughs> but you say most parents should not be scared of teenagers. You should not be nervous. There's a way to deal with them. So tell us what should parents look forward to? Oh, <laughs> so much. Let's do the good before we talk about the bad. Yeah, so much. I was terrified when my daughter was seven. I, I mentioned to you earlier, she was quite a feisty young lady. And when she was seven, I, I remember spending time catastrophizing about how terrible it would be when she was 14 how difficult that was going to be as a parent and it's not been anything like that so I always say to people don't waste your energy missing the lovely years of seven eight nine because they're lovely yeah. don't waste your energy worrying about what you think are going to be the horrible years of 14 15 16 because they might not be and even if they are tough in certain times then there's so much else that is that makes up for it. Teenagers today astound me with how wise they are about the world. They know things. They're really passionate about their environment, about diversity, about politics, about making the world a better place. Honestly, if if any one generation can sort the world out. It's this generation of young adults that are coming up now. They've. Re I really hope we support them and don't knock it out of them because they're 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 so they know so much and they're so smart, mm -hmm. but they're also amazing company. I laugh all the time because they're hilarious. They turn into adults, and then there's not just two of you bantering and and cracking quick repartees back and forth between you. There's four of us now. And so dinner table conversation is brilliant. Mm -hmm. And they're old enough to watch some of the older TV shows and films, movies that we go to now that we had to get babysitters for and see on our own. It's 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 a joy to take our kids with us and share that. Mm -hmm. They really fascinate. And then there's the joy as a parent of watching your child turn into the adult that they're going to be and that's so exciting for me I've got now mine are nearly 18 and 15 and it's so exciting to see what what they're interested in and which directions they'll take I think in everything that you said I, I agree because I think that's where I had a challenge growing up where I was coming into my own person and it was like uh no you still like live under my roof you would do exactly what I want you to do so there was yeah. no true support or understanding of who I was becoming mm -hmm. there was a script that everyone wanted me to follow and I was like no rebel united I'm not doing that this is my own person but I hear you because if I was supported and if I was listened to and allowed to have those conversations at the dinner table maybe I wouldn't have been a difficult teenager because you are allowing them to be who they are Children of today, like you said, 14 year olds, they're wiser than we ever were. They know so much. They can think on their own. They know what they want. They're passionate. They actually have passion. They're passionate about so many things. Back then, maybe not as much. Maybe some people were, and the parents were like, no, you're a child. You know, go study, go play with your friends. Why do you have an opinion? You know, like 
adults are speaking yeah. why are you <laughs> yeah exactly and it's a it's a I think it's a partly a generational thing and I definitely was raised that way my views weren't the most important at all in the house at all least it. important <laughs> and it was really obvious to me um but it, you know I can't blame my parents it's just the the generation that they came from I think our kids today are lucky that they've got a different generation of parents who've learned from that what they didn't enjoy and then they've got so much opportunity to learn that we never had. We didn't have the internet and schools weren't as engaging back then. It was learn your English, do your maths. That's it. <laughs> Things you probably will never use for the rest yeah. of the <laughs> Okay, so we've talked about the fun and the joyful part of having teenagers. What about the other parts that might be a little bit challenging that parents might be struggling with? Yeah. So, I mean, I paint a picture of it being great, being a parent of a teenager. I'm I'm not um, immune to the awareness of the fact that I'm quite lucky. My kids, they do present me with challenges, but they're not insurmountable. And that's actually, that's before I answer your question, I think that's something that parents ought to really trust themselves with. If they've got their kids to this age and they're pretty decent human beings there's every reason to think that whatever their kids then throw at them next they will also be able to cope with that and handle it mm. um, parents should have more faith in themselves um, but the tricky things I mean tricky things do exist and some kids for whatever their parents best intentions some kids do go down pathways that you'd rather they didn't and that they eventually will come to realize they wish they hadn't um, and then I think, yeah, we, we've had some conversations in our house. We've had some issues. It's not like it's all smooth. Mm. Um, I think the, the, this is what I say right from the beginning. If I could get hold of everybody at birth and say, talk to your kids, listen, as you said, listen to who they are and what they want, respect that. Don't let them have it all if that's not what your rules d dictate, but listen to them and there's an outside chance that when they're teenagers they will still be comfortable talking to you even when they're not really very comfortable talking to you because teenagers don't really want to talk to their parents <laughs> but they'll still feel comfortable to come to you they'll trust you if they're in a situation that where they're out of their depth and they don't feel comfortable in um and they may not do what you tell them they should do, but little bits of what you say will rub off on them and they may make a better decision. It's just, it really is just being there for them and respecting what they've got to say, even when you disagree with it. Mm. Honesty and open communication. It, it, it's, you know, I sound like I'm, I've, I've got it nailed. I haven't, I've got so much more to come with both my kids because they will throw random things at me every now and then, but when it's really tough, I tend to, I usually pick a, a, a time when I'm driving in the car and I'm in the front and they're in the back and I'll ask if we can have a conversation rather than a face-to-face -face over the table where I'm staring them down. Yeah. Um, and I'll ask them how they feel about whatever situation they're in first. And then there's an outside chance we might have an open conversation. And then if they make their, their choice to do something entirely different, then as long as I've said to them, I, I'm not sure that that is going to work for you because this, this and this, that's what I'm worried about. If they then make that choice, this is the really hard part. We can't control them. And you've mentioned this already. We have no power to stop our kids doing anything that they want to do other than by throwing them out of the house, which is a, a drastic extreme measure. Mm. Uh, I'm talking about when they're of age. Um <laughs> So it's 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 kind of acknowledging that I, and I'm the biggest offender of this. I really want to control my kids lives to the, the extent that they are they become what I wanted for them. And that's what I think our parents probably did reading between the lines with you. Yes. <laughs> um, and I resented it. I found ways to do the things I wanted to do behind their backs and didn't tell them anything about it and haven't really communicated with them much ever since. Exactly. And that's what our kids will do if we try to control them and lock them down. So, But I do think that is the hardest part of being a parent is 
realizing that you ultimately a have no control over them and b have been raising them all their lives to go and live independently of you without your input so this is what we've done we've we've want this but it's really hard when we get it Wow. Well, it's good to know that Well, I don't have kids, but I do have nieces, nephews and my friends have kids as well. And everyone struggles in one way or the other with their kids, especially the teenagers. And I think you just said it right. You've raised these kids all of their life up until now. You will be able to handle whatever they throw at your face. And I think even what you said in the beginning, when you were describing your, your two kids, completely different more parents just be aware these are individuals they will have their own personality they will have their own vision for their lives you've raised them it's hard but it might be time to just let them go allow them to be who they are meant to be and trust that whatever lessons you taught them when they were younger well there's a voice in there saying Mm -hmm. "Uh, you know you shouldn't really be doing this and that's all you can do but trying to control with force and like you said the whole eyeball to hey hey i'm I'm the parent here doesn't really work because what they do is they just Go around behind your back and just do it and say nothing about it. And I think that's the the worst that could ever happen between a parent and a child where the child is not trusting enough to confide yeah. in the parents on what's going on. Whereas- exactly. Yeah. And if they don't trust you, then they won't come to you when they're in that dire straight situation that they didn't expect to be in. They'll just try and figure it out on their own and maybe won't make the best decisions. Yeah. Wow. So to all the parents who might be struggling now with your child thinking, oh my God, I did not raise no dad. Maybe it's time to just <laughs> relax a little bit, be a bit calmer, you know, maybe focus on yourself and allow your kids to be who they're meant to be. Believe that you've done the work already and you can't control them. So just support yeah. them and make sure that you don't break that trust where now they're looking for that parental love outside of the home and talking yeah, to them. Yeah, yeah, that's the point. They get there comes a time when their peer group is way more important than you in terms of other people's opinions. Your opinions are not relevant anymore, but you've had 14, 15 years to to make them who they are. So you've shaped that, whatever they are, you've shaped it. So there's a good chance if you've done a good job that they, even if they go through a rough patch, they're going to come out the other side at some point. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. So a question for you now. So I know that with um, your daughter being diagnosed and now it sent you on a different path in life. If this hadn't happened, what would you have been doing instead? Is there something oh. that you wanted to do nine years ago <laughs> differently with your life? And it's like, okay, well now that's gone. Oh, um, I guess I would be, I would be making my money, my living through blogging, which I don't really at the moment. I I get paid little bits here and there, um, but it's not my main income at all. Uh, And I was just on the verge of really making a big name for myself. And I was really starting to go for it. And I literally now I, I didn't stop work, but now I look back for the amount of work I managed to create in those two years. I stopped work effectively. And I had to, so, but it's not what I really wanted to do. It's just the the direction I was heading. And actually, whilst I, I would give it back in a heartbeat, all of it, because it's, it, it's been horrible and it's still really tough and I don't want this for her. Mm -hmm. Um, I can't say that I haven't benefited from it in some way because I have, you know, I was a catastrophizer. I was panicking about her first night at university in nine years time. And I don't do that anymore. I think about the next challenge. So uh, uh, right now, my longest term issue is how I'm going to prepare her and make sure she's safe Mm -hmm. when she flies with school to the other side of the world and, and skis without me there. Um, and I, I, I'm not worrying about university yet because that's my next issue. Mm-hmm. And that's it is diabetes has really taught me to only solve the problems that you've got right in front of you and not worry about the problems that are 10 years down the line. Because when you get to 10 years down the line, those problems are going to look quite a lot different. Okay. Um, so it's really helped me to have less anxiety, ironically, even though it's a scary thing it's 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 quite a strange feeling um 
it it also sent me into therapy and it's helped me get a handle on where my pain comes from and how to manage that better and ultimately it's led me to thinking you know what I love therapy so much I want to be a therapist so now I'm pursuing a new (laughs) career and it's great and I love it absolutely and that's why they why they say most times for a lot of people your pain is what leads you to your purpose if this hadn't happened you have you wouldn't have been on this path so but while you're going through it you're like oh my god why me i don't want this but look at where it's brought you so for anyone mm-hmm. who's going through pain yes we're not minimizing it yes you're validated by how you feel but sometimes that could be the path that you need to be on to really fulfill your purpose in this life you 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 may never have be thought about becoming a therapist ever, but now you enjoy it so much. You love helping people and that's what you want to do. And you do it so effortlessly. That has led you to your purpose. You know? Yeah. Well, yeah. Effortlessly just by the sheer fact that there's been eight years of really not effortless at all, you know, but you that's life is hard, but you learn and then things become another layer of you rather than an effort. Yes. And then you, you help other people. And I think that's that's a phenomenal phenomenal thing that you're doing, supporting other mothers and parents just who have teenagers and trying to, to live life, learn to live with their teenagers. Yeah. So what final advice do you have for people who maybe the, the child has just been diagnosed and they think in the world is it's over, I can't do this, I don't have the strength. What would you say to them at this point? One, you can do it. And you will be able to do it and it will feel like you've got absolutely no hope and it's it's devastating. Honestly, those first few weeks were so bleak for me, but everyone will tell you that you will get there and it's true. That's why they tell you it's true because it is, it will happen. You will, you are capable of way more than you imagine. And two, just when you're feeling like that, it's because you're overwhelmed and you need and I wish I had, you need to make time. I know it seems impossible. It it absolutely felt impossible to me to make time for myself, but I gave up everything that I loved in order to take care of this one thing that I loved more than everything else in my life. Um, and I wish that I'd been able to find the space for a little bit of personal joy Um, So that's the other thing I would advise is just you don't it all the people all the parents in the diabetes groups used to say to me it's a marathon not a sprint diabetes and it's so true and I couldn't see it at the time you actually don't need to make your child's life with this new diagnosis perfect from day one because there's going to be many 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 years of it being some days perfect some days less than perfect some days awful and you can start that from the beginning. You don't need to be perfect from from the get go. Yeah, I, I think that's the perfect way to end. You don't have to be perfect from day one. You don't have to get it completely right and make time for yourself. Because if you don't take care of yourself, you can't take care of anybody else. So finding time for that self care, it's and your mental health as well. If you need to go to therapy, if you need whatever it, whatever you need to make sure that you're in a good enough state to be able to care for your child. Mm-hmm. thank you so much Helen for being here with us today that was super amazing and I really want to encourage a lot of parents if you're going through this and you're feeling lonely reach out there's many many groups out there there's Helen who can support you to take the load off to make it a little bit lighter it's never going to be easy life is not easy for anyone anyway but at least you can find the support and the encouragement to know that you can overcome this you can handle this and life can be normal and exciting and joyful as well. Definitely. Thank you so much for being here with us today, Helen. Thank you to all of my listeners. I hope you really um, enjoyed the show today. I will see you same time next week on iRise Conversations with Joan. Thanks for listening.